recording. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to our webinar and um, we are so gracious and thankful for Anna Herringer to give us giving us the time to do this. We know she's an extremely busy woman, but again, we really, really appreciate it. And this webinar is partnered with SEPT, um, which is in Ahmedabad, India. So we also have a lot of students from India and Manuel Marquez is also here representing SEPT. So thank you everyone. And uh, we're already late, so I won't take any more time. Anna, please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry I can't see you all, but I'm happy that, you know, this, this kind of uh, video stream goes beyond every sort of boundaries and that makes me very happy. I'm actually, this is my office. I'm, I'm right now at the border between Austria and, and Germany in Laufen, my hometown where I grew up. And I want to show you a bit of my work. So for me, I really deeply believe architecture is a tool to improve lives. And of course, architecture could also be seen as a tool to destroy lives, but I'm an idealist. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the status quo that we are having. I want to work towards a more ideal and a more just and a more safe and a more healthy planet. And um, that's where I'm putting all my efforts in. Um, so now the steering doesn't work. Okay. So this picture shows a, a study trip that I did with my students from ETH Zurich. It, it was the end of October in the mountains in Austria. It was really cold. I mean, end of October in our area is cold. And um, in, the afternoon, uh, in the afternoon, I surprised the students with the news that I haven't booked a hostel or a hotel or any sort of hut for them. And the challenge was to build your own shelter with whatever you could find. And it was a, it was a quite a, a challenge for the students, also for myself, because it was really cold. It was not really luxurious, uh, the results, but we managed to stay there for one night in, in all our little huts. And it was an amazing experience to discover that there are actually a lot of resources given by nature for free. And all you need is the sensitivity to see those resources and your creativity to use them. And when I was an architecture student, I found myself in a, in a similar situation. Uh, with, with, um, just before I did my diploma, I, I went back to the village. I, I spent um, as a volunteer when I was 19 years old in, in Bangladesh, in the northern part of Bangladesh. And I was a volunteer that time, it was 1997, uh, for um, a Bangladeshi NGO called Deepshika. And what I had learned from them was that the most effective strategy for, develop for development is always to look at the resources that you have available right on the site and try to make the best out of those resources, see them, value them, you know, use all your creativity and your time and passion and not trying to get depending on external factors. And that was what I tried to, to put into architecture then seven years later. In um, 2004, I did my diploma project in, at the University of Arts in Linz. And then 2005, we started to implement that project. So in terms of materials, I didn't have to look far. You know, the mud was just below my feet and the bamboo was growing all around. And then I'm also, apart from the, um, the local materials, I'm also very interested in the local energy resources. And for me, human labor is a very important source of, of energy. And when we think of, of sustainable and alternative energies, we always think of, of solar, of wind and so on. But for me, the human energy is a very essential point that is also really growing, a growing source. And furthermore, if we don't use that resource, we also create a social problem because we need to create work. We need to find work for, for a growing world population. So for me, that was a very important energy source. And then, of course, I also look at the, at the craftsmanship and the know-how that is available. And on top of that, I, I think, you know, um, information shouldn't be limited to, to a place. So I'm trying to collect all the information that are available and apply them to those local conditions. So tools were an issue too. And, uh, you know, we didn't have the mixing machines, but we had water buffaloes. And um, they did a fantastic job in mixing the straw and the earth and the water. And then this mix is just, you know, piled by hand on top of a good foundation. A good foundation is something that is essential for earthen architecture. And then you just cut this thing with a, mm, okay, the video is not working. Is it? Ah, 
And then you just cut this kind of wall into echo ridge um, shape with, with, with a sort of very simple spade. And that's how these walls are growing up. And of course, um, you have to deal with surprises. I, you know, we tested the, the, the bamboo structure with the very straight bamboo that was we imported to, to Germany from Colombia. And then we came on site and the bamboo looked like this. And that was of course a little bit of a surprise. And uh, also challenging the engineer first said, you know, with this bamboo, you cannot build this um, second story. I said, well, I cannot build this school without, you know, the head. It's just like <laughs> cutting the thing. And then we did tests and it was interesting because, you know, the problem that the curved bamboo that was really a problem finally was also a solution because we, we built it in a slightly curved way. And then we made a maximum load test with just every person we could find. You know, how many people could fit on a square meter or how much load could fit on a, on a square meter. And then you could see that it was really even. And, and we managed and also, you know, to get somehow to 12 and a half more or less straight meters, it was quite a challenge. But that's the nice thing, you know, when everyone comes together and brings the, the creativity in you, you solve problems. So the team was mixed. It was, uh, of course, mainly Bangladeshi from the direct surrounding, but I also had a team of, of craftsmen from Germany with me that in the back is my, my cousin and his wife, my cousin Emanuel and Stephanie. And then I also had an architect, Eike Rosbach, with me who was experienced because that time I was just freshly graduating from university and had seriously had no idea about building. So I needed that support. And after six months, the school looked like this. We had a little pause in between after four months for, for the drying period. And then another two, two, two months or altogether six months of construction period. The walls are really load bearing earth walls. There is no cement in the walls, only in the foundation. And then on top is, is the bamboo, um, uh, the bamboo ceiling and, and bamboo story. And for me, it was important to prove that with this kind of local materials, you cannot just build small and, and dark humid huts, but really really a big structures in architecture. And we kept the tradition through a Bangladesh to sit on the floor. And then through this bolt hole in the back wall, you come to the cave area. And that for me was an important element. I just tried to remember the spaces that I liked when I was a kid. And that is, you know, and I make this exercise always with all the students that I'm having from various backgrounds. And it's always this kind of protected feeling, this introverted feeling, you know, that you feel kind of hidden, but then you have you have the full perspective of what's going on. You know, either it's it's under a tablecloth, you know, or a table with large tablecloths, and you hear everything, you know, but no one can see you, or you sit under some bushes, you know, where you are hidden, but you still can see what's going on. So these are kind of the, these kind of situations um, that you have here. So you have the cave, but you still have the visual. Come in a visual um, connection to the classroom when what's going on. And also the idea is the school, the Metis school is orientated to, um, it's a little bit like Montessori, but, but has its own philosophy. So the different paces of children, of the, the learning and working paces are respected. So imagine you have a group of children and some are very fast in doing the task. And then, you know, usually they, you know, they, they are just um, making noise or making some, you know, being playful and whatever and distur disturbing the others who, who need more time or also making pressure, you know, why don't you, why don't you speed up and be a bit faster. So instead of, of creating this kind of friction, um, you could just grab a book and go in, in the cave areas and, and read and let the others um, finish in, in their time, in their speed. The, the tasks so and then of course these spaces are also used for for playing and for all sorts of things and that is the top floor that is very airy and you have the the, the colorful sardis underneath the roof and and these are just all elements that that you find when you're walking through the rural landscape so the the, the the clothes that are there for drying and and also you know in some of the huts you have it on top of, of the bed, you know, under the ceiling. So these are just elements that I'm, I'm collecting when I'm walking through the villages and then use it in a, in a different scale and then different, 
with a little bit of twist, but it's all kind of existing already. The children all signed with the names on the doors and they rightfully signed because they were also builders of the school. It was very much um, my hope and my, um, my wish that the, the, fuse, the future users will be included in the process. And I think it's very important to take everyone serious and, and um, also children, no matter how, how small and weak you are or how old you are, or if you're disabled or not, everyone wants to be taken serious and wants to be involved and, and doing something really meaningful and useful. So instead of leaving just some fingerprints or some, you know, some paintings or whatever, the kids were really in the afternoon after school, they came to the site and helped us building the school. And that was only possible because we were working with material that are not harmful, like the clay. It's just like normally you would have ceramic works or pottery works in the afternoon as a kind of um, artistic um, exercise. And we just had this in a slightly bigger scale. And for the kids, it was amazing because, you know, like in, in the beginning, of course, no one wanted to have a school with bamboo and mud because, you know, it's not, not regarded as, as fancy materials. But um, through this involvement, you know, children really became absolutely part of it and really got excited. And then they imagine yeah, they're coming home and then explaining to the parents, oh, I worked so hard on a site, my muscles are sore and, and I'm really, I worked very strong. So that gives an, an incredible boost in, in confidence. And I think you can all imagine how it feels when you stand in front of the school building after six months as a small boy or girl, or also as an illiterate day laborer who had never had the chance to, to go to a school in his life. So and you stand there and you know you did this all just by using your hands, your own hands and the dirt beneath your feet. And that just gives an enormous boost of confidence in, in your own potentials and your own resources, but also of course in the team, in the community and in the local materials. And that is very important because yes, these materials are seen as, as poor material, materials. And um, I think it's very important to show that, that there's a lot of beauty in these materials and you can actually build really lasting and, and also like really good quality of architecture with it. And for earth and architecture, for example, it's proven that you can have it lasting for a very long time. I mean, Yes, there are mud houses existing that are 500 years old. Show me one concrete house that is 500 years old. It's not existing. So, but we have this perception that it's not just a very vulnerable material and it's not standing for a long time. But in fact, if you consider certain technical issues, they can stand for a long time. So the first important rule is to have a good foundation. And therefore, I guess I also use concrete or, or tiles or, or of, of uh, not tiles, bricks or stones, but only for the foundation because therefore the mud is really not a suitable um, material. And then I go with pure mud walls that are only mixed with straw and then of top, on top of it, the, the, the bamboo mud ceiling and then the, the, the bamboo structure. And of course, the second um, rule is a good roof that protects you and that the water is not leaking into the walls. And then the third role is erosion control. So just imagine a hill when a hill doesn't have any trees or any rocks and the water is running fast over the hill, there will be a lot of erosion. But when there are trees and rocks, then the water is very slow. And then the force of the erosion, the energy that can cause the erosion is very limited. So you have to include kind of speed breakers in these facades that limit the, the, the flow of the water, the speed of the water. And you could do this either with lines of bamboo or tiles or even small lines of, of mortar. And then on, on a, a micro level, you have to put something in the mix that also creates this roughness. So in the first few years, there will be some sort of erosion. There will be maybe one or two centimeters come off and then the straw will stick out and that creates a rough surface that also helps to, re to reduce the speed of the water running down the facade. Same thing happens if you add stones, for example. So these kind of elements are important. And there's also a natural crystallization process happening. It was pretty amazing after 
you know, I came back to, to see the Metis school every year. And after like four years, I saw that the, the walls became really like, like stones. It was really so hard because there is this breathing in of the humidity and exhaling the humidity. And there's some sort of crystallization process going on. There has been no research on it, but you can see that on, on all old, old mud houses. That's the school, how it looks now. So it's really aging well. And, you know, for me, it's so wonderful. The mod is, for in terms of ecological sustainability, really and the champion because it's the only material you can take from nature, recycle it as often as you want without any loss of quality, and you can turn it, give it back, return it back to nature without leaving any scars and, and, and plant a garden on top of it. And that's the only material can do that. And, and that's for me such an important circle and, and cycle that, that uh, you know, no other material can have this kind of closed, closed um, circle. And in terms of, of economic sustainability, it was for me a great chance that I was living also in that village. And, and in the evening, I would go with the workers together on the local market and I could see how they spent the money that they had just received because they got their wages every day. And then I could see, you know, they, they bought vegetables from neighbors or got a new haircut, a bicycle repair, the new sari blouse. So the money, the building budget was really invested directly in the community. If I had built the school with, with, with the steel and concrete, this money would have been lost for the people that would have been gone to the pockets of some big companies, maybe from, from Bangladesh, maybe from outside of the country, but you know, it would have been definitely lost for the people. And for me, that's when it comes to environmental, uh, to, to economic sustainability, it's not a question how cheap something can be, but the question is who is getting the profit? That's much more important, you know, who is getting the profit? And I really hope that, the, and, and I'm, I'm aiming always that the biggest possible amount of money of the building budget is really remaining with people, with the craftsmen and helping families and not just helping getting uh, rich people more rich. Yeah, after the METI school um, and through the, the recognition that we got and, and some certain award money, for example, the Aga Khan Award, um, I was able to do the second building in, in, in Bangladesh, the Deshi building, which is an, a, a school for electrical, a vocational school for electri electrical training. And we also kept the focus on, you know, going two story with the mod because first the mod is more durable than the bamboo. And also to show, you know, it's, it's very weird. It's one of the, it, the population density and the housing, then at the, the land scarcity, scarcity is really enormous in Bangladesh. It's the, it's land is the, the most precious resource. Still most of the people in rural areas go in a horizontal, um, expand in a horizontal way. And they don't go in two story structures. So we really wanted to focus on, you know, how to build the two story structures in a good way so that you can save this, this place for food cultivation, for example, and bio biodiversity. And we also try to bring in more craftsmanship and, and, and more refinement that we had in the Meta School. For example, the basket weaving is, is also there getting also le less and less uh, job opportunities because of course the, the plastic buckets are also getting more and more cheap and people turn to buy the plastic buckets and not and not the woven baskets anymore. So I just took, you know, weaving techniques and, and, and used it in a different scale and in a different purpose. That's the space um, I think the, the people in, in Rotopur love the most. It's like, um, yeah, because when there's always so many people around and, and when you are outside, you hardly have any privacy. And, and in this space, you're outside, you're kind of um, embraced by nature, but you still have a certain privacy. And that, that is, is somehow a very poetic place for them. So here you see the, the ground floor plan. That were actually the drawings that we used for building. So when, when we started the, the project, I didn't have uh, a finished planning at all. I just had a feeling in my belly how this, this building could look like in the end. And we had no section, even no elevation that came later. So I, I started with a floor plan and then every day I would just add some more measurements and then started to, to grow it very organically, very intuitive. And that was only possible 
because I was first I was constantly there and also because the team um, we knew each other really well and and I knew what they are able to do and when I'm able to or when I when I could stand a bit back give them more freedom and when I have to step in again to hold the strings together so it was really a very intuitive and organic process and I enjoyed it enormously to, to work that way so that would just be you know after work and during the day I was working with the workers on the site and then after after you know the, um, after the final round, I would sit down and do the sketches for the next day. And that was the team that was on my side. It's a local con contractor, Montoram Shaw and uh, Stefan Neumann, an, um, an engineer from Germany. And then Kondaka uh, Hasebul Kobe, a, a teacher from Prague University and students. I had several students of Bangladesh also with me. Yeah, so um, that was also women on site was something I really hoped for in already during the Meta school and I did not succeed with with having women on the site because I was just told you know it's not our it's not tradition that you know that first they cannot do it and and secondly it's not not our tradition our culture and then I I just um, took it as as given but then in, in this project uh, because I had really quite nice um, female students also on the site and this flood level was quite high amongst the workers and and then I you know when I was walking through the village I got like really weird um, atmosphere and the wives of my workers weren't happy at all about seeing their husbands flirting with the students on the site and then I thought okay there is some friction going on within the families that I absolutely don't want to have and then I talked to the to the wives of 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 the, the workers and, and ask them if they would also like to join um, me on site and, and join our work team. And then I said, yeah, we would like to, but we have no idea what we can do, or how we can contribute. And then while talking with them, we figured out that they usually do the plastering. And then they said, well, we can't do the, use the tools, but we can do it by hand. I said, wonderful, it will look anyway more beautiful. And then and we said, okay, from next morning on you come. And they said, yes, but don't tell our husbands. And then I did not. So seven o'clock in the morning, their husbands came. And five minutes later, their wife showed up. And then, of course, there was like long faces. And like, you know, the husbands know the fun is over. But like after a week or so, they started flirting with their own wives. And it was really nice because they were working as a team, you know. And then you, you queue for the same amount of salary in the end of the day. And, and that created such a strong bond and also, you know, this, this kind of non-hierarchy on the site that was helping also a lot to contribute to, to the family situation even. Yeah, and that was um, a project that uh, the students were responsible for that were um, houses for three farmer families to show, you know, how to go in two-story way and, you know, how to also include the glass windows and certain assets that make it more, you know, give, give more quality to the things. And the students were also doing the same thing as me. They were designing and building and, and communicating with the clients all at the same time. So the things were also really organically growing. Yeah, this is a, vi um, a video that always um, really deeply hurts. Oh, sorry, how can I switch off this thing? That really always touches me deeply when I see it. That's the scenery I'm passing when I'm leaving Dhaka and, try to, and, and going up in the north. So it's like this belt of brick um, chimneys and brick fields around Dhaka. Um, you know, to, to fire and trying to improve mud and while putting all these carbon emissions in, you know, that going unfiltered in the air. And I'm just wondering, why don't we take, take this wonderful raw product mod and not adding this energy, this carbon emissions, but adding our know-how, adding our creativity to make something beautiful out of it. Because this kind of, this um, trying to, to enhance materials with, coal or with, with, with whatever or with oil or with whatever energy is certainly a way we cannot continue in future anymore. Oh, yeah. And we also did a, a little workshop with, um, that was 
the idea and the wish of the Institute of Architects in Bangladesh and together with the Housing and Building Research Institute of the, the government and with the University Beisawatat in, in Austria. Martin Rauch and I did this workshop um, for architects in Bangladesh and engineers. And what you see in the background, these are all the, the, the structures that are usually like the, the pilot project for sustainable structures in, or for sustainable building in Bangladesh. And, and we did our little earth pavilion as an example, you know, just with the mud that we found there. Um, and you could already see that this has so much more authenticity and archaic power, just, you know, using the raw material rather than trying to improve it with by adding cement or by adding, um, you know, by, by firing the bricks. Yeah, the latest project I, I just finished end of last year in, in Rundapur, which is a, a center for people with disabilities and also um, a tailoring workshop. And it just, uh, yeah, the, these are the latest photos that I just got. So um, when you approach the building, the most dominant thing is, is, uh, is kind of a ramp that is winding up around the building. And for me, it's a um, it's very important um, symbol, you know, for in inclusiveness. Because, of course, for, for the people in that area, they have never seen a ramp. And then such an impossible, you know, it, such a big ramp um, winding up around the building that just creates questions, you know, why is this ramp and why do we need that? And then you start talking about inclusion, you know, why it is important that you know, if people with disabilities are also included in, in, in everyday life and, 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 and that it's important that they are able, you know, that we don't, that we decrease the obstacles that they have in, in, in moving and so on. And, and then another important sign of this building is while, you know, all the other buildings are very, you know, the rectangular straight box in a way, which was, I think, that time important to show that you can build with mod in a very accurate and precise way. With this building, it's, this building is kind of dancing when you look at the floor line, it's completely dancing. So it's like, for me, a way to show it's good that we are not all just the normal box, you know, that, that we have people that are just completely not following the logic, maybe. And, and, it's, um, and that there's an extreme beauty also in that. And, and we should celebrate this diverse, uh, this, this, uh, that we are all diverse and that we are all different. And that is what I'm trying to express through the architecture with that building. So, and it's also important because um, probably the same in, in your countries, it's like um, that um, there's a quite high number of, of, of people with disabilities, also often caused by poverty, malnutrition or hard work of, of the mothers especially. And, um, and it's just very often given as as a situation you have to deal with it's a maybe it's a, a karma or it's a challenge or whatever and you just accept that but that there are actually therapies that can help to improve the situation and and this is kind of unknown so with this building uh, being so different of course um it, it creates visibility and then of course it creates also the the awareness that you can actually really um you're not just uh, people with disabilities are not just a precious part of our society but you can actually also uh, really improve situations by by certain uh, therapies so this is just a, a way through this building it's actually really nice the ramp in the beginning i thought i have to make shortcuts you know and we also have a shortcut because i thought it's so annoying you know to to walk down, uh, up this, this long kind of 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 ramp, but actually I loved it so much. I never took the shortcut because you are somehow with the mud, everything is so soft and you're so somehow gliding up this, and we are really dancing up in a way, this, this, this building. Under the ramp um, is the cave area, similar to the Meta School, just a little bit longer. You know, it's linked to the therapy room. So if you need a break, you just go and, and retreat. And that's the, the, the top part. And um, this is the, a small studio for, for textile workers. And for me, that is a very important project as well. Um, I also started, meanwhile, my own textile 
um, label and fashion label and it started because I was invited once um, from from the GL set to, to take part at the, at the workshop about ideas how to make the garment sector more sustainable in Bangladesh. And um, of course, also being in Bangladesh for over 20 years now, you can't just not see how, the, how much impact the, the garment sector has on the settlement patterns and the rural to urban migration. And you see that, you know, there's so much labor force um, driven from the rural areas to some hot spots of, of textile production where the people don't have enough or where there is just not enough resources to, to enable humane conditions for the people, for so many people. So I, I thought, okay, what can we do to take the pressure of these hot spots and bring some work opportunities to the rural area where people are so much still able to, to create a lot of things that they need for their daily lives, including their housing by their own, on, on their own. So, so I thought, okay, what can we do? And I found as an architect, I'm, I'm at my limits with, with what I can do. And I found that it's more, more effective to design a product that can be produced in a decentralized way. So that also without electricity and a lot with hand stitching, so that it really enables women to stay in, in the villages where they have quite a lot of independence. So together with the NGO Dipshika and, and also Veronica Lang, who is, is a, a, a master tailor and a fashion designer here in, in my hometown, we got together and we designed uh, products and, and textiles that are absolutely unique also using the resources and the beautiful textile um, culture that you have also, of course, India and Pakistan has, but Bangladesh, of course, too. And, uh, the, the drama is that when we think of made in Bangladesh, of clothes made in Bangladesh, we think of a stupid t-shirt with a stupid print on it, you know, and then it doesn't matter if it's Boss, Nike or H&M, you know, it's just the same t-shirt with a different print on it. And, and of course, there will be also soon, I mean, the technology is already existing that you can just, you know, plot these things or knit these things by machines and you don't even need people anymore. So what do you do with countries, you know, that really depending on, on such sectors. So we really wanted to create products that are absolutely unique, that cannot be um, just replaced by, by some technologies and that they also show a, a lot of humanity. And I think you all know this kind of old sari blankets that are made of this um, recycled or reused saris. So before they're falling into pieces, they come to this little uh, workshop and then the ladies are cutting in and making this kind of clothes out of it. And in the beginning we thought it's, uh, they could do it from their own home, you know, in a decentralized, completely decentralized way, they just take the textiles home and um, they, they can work with the children at their side and so on. But they actually enjoyed it so much to come together that we saw we, we are actually in need of a building. And because they wanted to go to an office, you know, also to have this pride that they are leaving home now and to go to work. So that was another reason why we needed this building. So, but before it came, before the architecture came, the design of the product. And then we also started to, to document all our projects on, on this uh, recycled sari blankets, the made this school here, just to provide work opportunities, but it turned out to be really um, beautiful. Yes, going back to the mud, it might not be on our focus and on our radar, but still a lot of people all around the globe in diverse um, climate zones and cultures are living in mud houses, yet it's not visible in our magazines. It's not included in our curriculum in the universities. So I brought the mud to Harvard, precisely uh, 60 tons of mud right in front of the Credit School of Design. And faculty and students came together, also the public of Cambridge came together to just transform a quite windy, noisy, and I would say unfriendly space into um, a nice situation for people together. And you would find all different people coming together, of course, professors, students, but also uh, retired people reading a book, children were coming, skaters were coming, of course, and even some, sometimes homeless people would stay there overnight. So that was a really wonderful mix of, of people that usually 
is not coming together at, at this place. And interestingly was that the mud in Boston is, is gray and it almost looked like concrete. I mean, you could, it looked like ramped concrete. But interestingly, people always um, stop to touch the walls. And I, for me, that was really very clear to see that we don't only perceive architecture and materials on a visual level, but there must be something more that we, we perceive architecture with more senses than, than just than just the visual ones. Yeah, I also co-authored a book, Upscaling Earth, with Lindsay Blair Howe and Martin Rauch together, where we talk how society would change and how, how our planet, of course, would be affected if we built with much more um, earth than with cement, for example. And with, of course, and that relates also to other buildings, uh, other building materials from natural sources. But earth is, is a very important source for the future simply because it's everywhere underneath our feet. And it can be built in a low tech way, just we did in Bangladesh, but it can also be built in a high tech way. Like this picture shows, for example, it's prefabrication, a technology developed by Martin Rauch. And these were the blocks where Herzog Dommeron built the Ricola Herb Center in Switzerland. Of course, when you have a country where labor costs are extremely high, you have to shift some of the production to, to kind of machines. But the nice thing with Earth, you, you can do it high tech, you can do it low tech, and you can do it high and low tech mixed, yeah, depending always on the context. And therefore, I really also believe it's a very a suitable building material for, for the future. So you create these earth blocks and because there's no cement added, you just make this kind of joints wet and put the same earth material in the joints and then the joints become invisible and becomes really monolithic without having this iron inside that you usually need to have something, you know, uh, to, to, to reduce those kind of lines. Yeah, this is how, how it, it would look like. And besides the technological development, I also strongly believe we need good build project, good architecture that show the beauty of these materials and that you can build modern architecture with very old materials also. And it's not a matter how old the material is, it's a matter of our creative ability to use it today. And that's our core discipline as, as architects, you know, to, to have this creativity. And these are three hostels that I did in, in China, in Baosi, a small village. And the core of these structures is stones and ramped earth and attached to this, um, to this core that hosts the facilities like toilets and showers and so on. The fireproof staircase are like concorns, the sleeping um, units for the boys and the girls. Yeah, and for me, this picture is always um, quite um, painful as well. If we just think, you know, all these people that have, you know, I mean, in, in China, it was an incredible speed. Um, within just a handful of years, more cement was consumed than the United States were consuming in 100 years. So it's just an incredible speed that we're having, but it's not just China, of course, um, a lot of countries following. Uh, India certainly too, and Pakistan. So um, we need alternatives, you know, we just can't continue. And the next thing is, you know, what's coming up is all this is air condition because, you know, <laughs> we all know that it's not as comfortable to live in a concrete, a concrete box than to live in a, in, a, in a mud box. And that can balance the humidity and so on much better. So that comes on top. First, you need all these carbon emissions to build these structures. And then you need all this energy to cool the structures again. You know, that absolutely doesn't make sense. So why don't we just take the natural building materials and build in respect with the local climate and, and with all the wisdom that we have from the past, with all the creativity and know-how that we have today and try to make really independent structures that also can go back to earth one day again. 
Yeah, for me, this is, you know, we had the Fridays for Future demonstrations a lot, and my daughter had this less concrete, more earth sign that she was uh, carrying around. And I think that's, uh, for me, I, I took this, I, I kept taking this, this signboard to every place. I went to every lecture. I went to, you know, diverse cultures. And I think that the nice thing, it makes sense everywhere. You know, just to, it's such a logic thing to take the material that you find on a site to take also to accept vulnerability, to understand the climate, and then to create the architecture out of these parameters of, of the vulnerability of, of the material, of the characteristics of the material and the climate. And that creates an architecture that is absolutely unique and it's, it's made for this place. And that is also authentic. And I think this, is, this authenticity is also something that we are lacking in our modern architecture that becomes, becomes kind of random in a way and detached from, from the context. Yeah, um, working in Europe is, is more challenging for me because the labor costs are so, so incredibly high. So together with Martin Rauch, I was um, asked to design an interior space, an atrium in, in a company called Omicron in Austria. And we built this um, earth block with very simple, just by using our hands and the wet soil and, and shaping that, you know, just with, with our muscles and with our own physical energy. And it was interesting because, you know, how can you transport a system that works in, in, in Bangladesh, for example, to, to, to Austria? And then we figured out it's horribly expensive to do it here. And it's such a big thing, you know, to get the regulations uh, to be according, you know, in line with all the regulations and so on. And for me, it, it absolutely didn't make sense, you know, for me, or it showed the, the problematic that we have in our economic system. If, if the one of the oldest building techniques on earth, you know, taking the material and shaping it with your hand is so damn expensive here, then there's something wrong with our economic system. A, a material that is, is good for the planet, is, is healthy for the people, and that creates jobs should definitely be not, you know, be so much um, um, loaded with taxes, while materials that have a lot of carbon emissions in like steel, like aluminium, like cement, have kind of uh, substituted, you know, there is no taxes on this carbon emission. So I'm really trying to fight for a, diff a change also in our political system that we have taxes on carbon emissions and materials that in have and, and have a lot of this carbon emissions embodied and, and, and uh, decrease the load on, on, on the human energy on the other hand. So that it's, it's, it's again possible to build with the most natural and most common building methods that we have on this planet and that are good for us. So for me, a very important question is always when I'm designing is always having this times 7 billion in, in my mind. You know, the world is not changing with one single big decision. The world is changing with everyday small decisions that we're taking. And when we design, you know, do we take this material or do we take that material? Do we, you know, use this paint? Maybe this is just one liter of paint, but if we take it 7 billion times, you know, if 7 billion people would take now the same decision, it would be a lot of paint and it would completely destroy our water systems and, and, and nature. So for me, you know, every material I'm choosing and every design approach I'm, I'm, I'm choosing, I'm, I'm trying to, to multiply in my mind with 7 billion times and, and ask myself, does it contribute to social justice or not? And does it contribute to a healthy planet or not? And, and, and who's getting the profit? So for, for me, this, this question is, is a very essential one. So that's the technique that we used for, for Omicron that is used in many places of the world and which is not possible yet anymore to do it in Europe, except you do it, you're your own client and you have a lot of time and you do it yourself, then yes. But so I'm really also fighting in terms of political change for that. So this is how we built it. And that's the nice thing again, you know, you ha can have everyone involved, a lot of unskilled people as well. And it was just growing like that. And it created really um, beautiful spaces inside and, and it's a very high tech company. And so they have a very archaic space. And I think that's also something very beautiful on, on building with earthen structures you have immediately from the first day on you have the feeling this building is standing there 
since a very long time and you have this archaic atmosphere and I think this is a lot of power in this archaic atmosphere and still you can shape it in, in a kind of a, in a spacey way as well. And that's the other structure that we did, the Zeppelin that also acts as an illuminator of the space. And we also used, you know, it's not always building the entire building with mud. Sometimes you also use it just as a plastering on the walls. And mud has a wonderful capacity and that is balancing the, the indoor humidity. And you know it all, when it's cold and it's humid, it's more, you feel more cold. And if it's hot and humid, you feel more hot. So if this humidity is balanced and the mud can do it, then you feel much more comfortable. You don't have a fungus problem and so on. So we put in that company also a lot of mud as plastering on the wall, where we also shaped it, that was just shaped with some spoons or you know some different techniques that we used. And that is also, these are also ways that I'm trying now to include participation in my building projects in, in Germany or Europe. And this is a method, um, you see now a process of a design process that I'm using, I call it clay storming. I developed that together with Martin Rauch. And you know, in the beginning, we just cut out the, the, the square meters, the volume that we need, you know, the, the, the client asked us to build and we cut it out in 3D in clay blocks. And then we, we start deforming these blocks. And then it just goes in an intuitive way, you know, and it, completely the impulses go right from the belly to the hands, you know, with, without discussing much, we just um, go and, and design our buildings. And of course, first always comes an, 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 um, a research of, of the site and, and, and the potential. And this was, for example, in, in Chattisgarh in Durk, where we checked, you know, what are the local methods and, and clay techniques and, and the walls are built completely without formwork. So, I thought, yes, I can also do curves. Why not? When we do it without formwork, and then you know things are coming up like this. This is a campus for Kekemori University, and then it goes into 2D and 3D, and then it goes back to the model where we can change some dimensions. And that's a project that I'm doing right now in Germany. The center part is an earthen structures, a center for people, a center for sustainability, and then a boarding hostel and timber structure. And then we also started together with the client, you know, we had the masters that we know we had to dis distribute on this, um, on this site. And then we test different versions, you know, where we could place, where we could add things. And then we've refined it then together in, in my team in the office. And that's a master plan that we are currently doing for Ghana. In, um, on the close to the border to Togo in Africa. So that was, that was actually the master plan that was given um, the, from the Ghanaian side. And the thing is that when you drive through any African country, you see this master plan Im implemented a lot. And that comes of course a lot from Western missionary times, you know, when you just, you know, a, a school has to look like this, it has the veranda and then you know, you go in, in, in the classrooms and, and you just lay it out according to a grid. And then we I just took this kind of blocks and, and deformed it because all around, you know, this site, you have the most beautiful vernacular structures with this round huts and everything. So it's also important to keep this, this cultural diversity alive. So that's kind of how, how I'm, I'm working, you know, I'm really looking for the spaces that are there already in, in the vernacular structures and how can I incorporate it in, in a more modern way. And there you see how it goes from that small scale to the big scale. So that was the very first uh, model I did with Martin Rauf also for the Biennale in Venice. Where we did also together with Anders Lepic. So it was a small scale model, then it went a bit bigger and then it got 3D scanned because we had to please the engineer and we had to have some drawings, but actually this step we didn't really need. And then it goes on the site and then it's just like, you built the small scale, you built up the big scale. And then this was how it was finally uh, standing in, in Venice at the Biennale of 2016.
And of course, you could plot these kind of structures also with the big 3D plotter, but I think there is a lot of power in the process. And for me, the process is just as important as the outcome. We always learn how to design our buildings, but we never learn how to design the process. And I think there's, you know, you can, the, the process has the power to also not just to build a building, but also community and relationships. And I think this is something we should really have a focus on as well, that is that the process is just as important as the outcome. And that um, kind of focus on, on the process was also in that project, also together with Martin now, it was an, in my first project that I, I was commissioned in, in, in Germany. It was uh, for a very old um, church, a cathedral that had a very historic place in, in, in Germany, in Worms. And the background was from a very famous, uh, famous Baroque architect, Balthasar Neumann, and we were commissioned to make the altar in front of it. And we proposed not to bring the, the ready-made art piece, but we bring the material and then the community comes together and builds the altar uh, themselves, the most sacred place from, from the cathedral. So we turned the cathedral into a construction um, site for a week and then we all started building and people from all around the places came that were living in, in, in Worms and helped um, getting the mud inside and then the ramming started. And it was for the people really exciting to be able to, to construct this thing together. And it was also so symbolic, you know, um, you have all this gold and these rich materials in the background and that's so symbolic for our society. We are not lacking of resources and materiality, but we are lacking of, of good relationships and meaning. And, you know, this kind of processes can bring this meaning and can create this meaningful and, and good relationships. And I think this was really a, a wonderful experience for all of us who participated there. And also the priest participated really heavily and it was a massive work. I mean, this ramming is well, not just leaving a fingerprint. It was really an effort. But I think, you know, the, the happiness factor is increased the more effort you have to, to put in to reach a goal. So that was very visible with that project. And we also had people coming to bring in um, earth from different parts of the world. We had historic things from the Roman Empire, but then people were coming to bring in personal things. And, and the Indian nuns that were living for since a long time in Worms, they brought, you know, I had some, some soil from India, so I gave it to them and they in, inserted it in the altar and they started crying. And you could feel how emotional this material also is and that it is so symbolic. And, and I think earth is much more than just a building material. I mean, we have so many songs, poems, and, and myths about earth, you know, mother earth. I mean, there is no mother concrete or mother steel, you know, there is there's just something more, a very deep connection between humankind and, and, and the element earth. Yeah, for the kids, it was also really amazing to have the the hands in the mud, they really enjoyed it. They came once we invited them, they, then they start coming back every day to see, and then they put in some glitter just to mark the, the layer that they brought in. And then, you know, the, the chicken got out of the eggshell and it was a, a very moving moment. And that's again, the, the thing, you know, once once it's there, you couldn't say if it's there since a long time or if it's just freshly built. It has this, this is really a, a very, there's a lot of power in, in, the, in this material and a lot of atmosphere. Yeah, for me, that is a very important symbol, Alpha and Omega, that represents the beginning and the ending. We architects are always in love with the beginning, you know, it's always exciting to build something we don't try to look at, at the ending of, of something, you know, it's like there's something, but if we really want to build sustainable, if we really want to build in harmony with nature, we also have to accept death, you know, it's part of nature is, is also decay. So we should really not just think of the beginning of a building, but we also should design in a way that it can go back to the earth without leaving scars, but just leaving know-how to use 
to reuse the resources in a better way. You know, that's, I think, an important thing. Yeah, that's my own home. I live in a 400 year old home and that's the earth wall that I inserted there. And we really enjoy our, our, our earth oven on earth wall. It gives such a warm presence in our home. My, also do my daughter got a, a little Meti cave in her room. And my personal dream is to build a skyscraper somewhere in Manhattan, in wherever, in, in, in any danced, densely populated city, because I, I really believe that it would feel so good also in danced urban spaces to bring the nature back, to bring this archaic feeling back. I think it would just make an, a really good feeling in, in, into urban spaces as well. And this dream isn't that crazy if I think of of the mud city of Shibam that was built like um, 500 years ago also. And with all the technolo technologies that we have in our hands right now and that are available, we should be able to use that also for today and for, you know, that it needs the, meets the needs and the aspirations of, of the people. And um, I really strongly believe if we just, you know, use all the materials, the natural materials that are given by nature for free that we have all around and just below our feet. I really believe that our cities and our homes and our rural areas and, and our workplaces would not just become more sustainable and healthy, but also more humane and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I don't know when and how you have done so much <laughs> but it's amazing um and and so great to see uh and so um we have a few questions that have come in um and we can take about do you have 10 to 15 minutes to answer a question mm -hmm. 10 minutes would be good <laughs> great so the first question how do you how did you select the area where to make these community centers did the communities later expand or duplicate them across their villages so that, that was the area of, of the NGO that was, was given. And it was not, you know, there was no master plan existing in, in the beginning. It was um, it, it just developed, you know, like the, like the last center, like the women, uh, the tailoring workshop, for example, that was not in our plans. We thought, you know, they can do it from in their own mud huts. But then we saw they need a place. So it, it, it grows out of the need of the people. And the nice thing was that um, I was hardly on the site. I was the very beginning to discuss the details with Monto, with the contractor. And then um, Stefano Mori from my team was there for like two weeks in between, but it was the level where already the roof um, came up uh, on top of the structure. So the mud structure, they built it all on their own, the mud and the bamboo. So that means that the know-how is really rooted now there. And that's, that for me was extremely fascinating that they are able now to build this thing completely without me. And the only thing, the only part probably that they still um, would like to have is an input is the design. But I mean, it doesn't have to come from myself. It could come from anywhere. But it's, it's really the know-how is really rooted. What's a bit missing still is, you know, that, that uh, notion of organizing themselves. This is something that, you know, that they haven't figured out this like, it, the, the last bit of piece is missing that they organized themselves the mud, you know, also it's all around. So next step will be definitely just to pile them, give them every one a pile of, of, of mud, you know, because they know how to deal with these things. It's just, it's just that they are not organized and then they're shifting it from one month to the next or from one year to the next, but they are fully able to, to build these structures on their own now. Okay. Um, so we have another question. The issue with vernacular architecture or indigenous construction practice is that it cannot coexist due to the evolving climatic conditions. Some years back, the traditional construction practice of Kashmir, the Tajidivari system failed during the flood because it was never designed to sustain flood or heavy rains. What is your view on this? How can we use the existing construction methods while evolving and mending these traditional techniques to make a sustainable built form? Yeah, of course, um, there is one issue that we are settling in places that are vulnerable, where we should probably not settle, like on seashores or, you know, in areas that are just prone to, to um, 
like this this kind of a situation so that of course is something that is difficult to, to deal with but we should not build there at all i mean no matter with what kind of structure and then of course we have to adopt this this vernacular structures but um you know the solution is not to pour in more concrete and 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 and, and steel and and because you know even you know because it, it just adds to more climate change so we have to to look first of course is the select the selection of a good place where it's safe to to settle and where one should not settle and then of course find the appropriate architecture for it but i think there is a lot of know-how in the vernacular architecture that can be used for these sorts of things and maybe you need hybrids you know maybe in the in, in some areas you need hybrids where you have the this typical reinforced um, concrete pillar systems, but you don't fill it with baked bricks and fire bricks, but you fill it with mud bricks, for example. Yeah. All right. Um, there is a lot of intuition and organic process involved in your work. What makes it yours? We see your work and we can identify as yours, but what is that element for you that makes it Anna? Generally, if we give freedom to design like that, logic seems to defy and override the intuitiveness. How has the, oh, this is a multi, multifold question. How has the architectural education fed into your process? And how can this aspect of playfulness and intuition be reflected in our architectural education and practices? Yeah, what makes the building honor? I think, um, I, I think like the buildings is, is like, as if you, give birth to, to a child, you know, the child is never your own. It's always an own entity, you know, that maybe has some genes of you <laughs> and, but, and, and some heritage, but, but it's always an entity on its own. And, and for me, it's always interesting, you know, to start with this mud block and no idea what's coming out of it. And sometimes it's super edgy and sometimes it's, it's super playful. Like the, the, the campus in India, that client, Chado Modi, that is her energy. When I saw it, what was coming out, I thought, this, this is Chado, this is not me, you know, and this is fun when, when, when something completely different comes out as if you expect the things to be. And um, yeah, um, that, that's, I think that I, 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 I would say I have no style, but I have intuition and, and I'm very happy that I have a good connection to, to intuition. And I think you can train this as much as you can train your national a rational part of the brain. You can also train your intuitive part of the of the brain. And for me, the clay storming method is a very good good technique to to kind of to get in touch with this in, intuition. And I'm I'm training this, and I did courses in Harvard at ETH Zurich and Liechtenstein. So it's 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 of course something as as much as you can train arguing and and analyzing. You can also and trained to in intuitive design and for me it's it's also uh, yeah it's it's something that um i think brings more the, the playful element that you mentioned i think that comes in when you add more intuition you know i i have the feeling i mean in former times no one was using a grid because people had an intuitive feeling, you know, of four spaces and quality and proportions. And we lost this feeling and we don't trust in that anymore. So we need rules and regulations. We need grids to hold on. But this, this doesn't make really, you know, doesn't really create the spaces that we love. When we go on holiday, we always go to the more intuitively designed spaces. And I think it's time that we change our curriculum to give also space and importance and focus in on intuition and and i think it has also to do i mean in my own studies it was very difficult because i i started over from the intuitive side I, I had to have a feeling of the character of building of the personality before i could start I think even start thinking of of you know where's the entrance where is you know how do i organize these things and um and for my professor, it was a disaster, you know, as he said, you don't have to think about this poet, poesy thing and, you know, of the character of the building, I want to know where is the entrance. <laughs> and, and for me, that was not important at that moment. So you can start a building from that side and you can start a building from that side. And usually it's always trained, we're trained to use it from, to start from a very rational side. And we, 
we have this analysis in the beginning where you pile up all the information for weeks and for weeks and then you know you feel like Ooh, your head is exploding and then you have to start designing it and then you're completely blocked because you know your head is like this and you also have the pressure that now the thing has to be perfect because you did all this research and now all this knowledge has to be there and then you start making rational grids and then it goes away and i think this has to be changed and i have the feeling especially i, I think it's a, a more female approach as well i think i have the feeling a lot of female students told me finally you know it's okay for them to say you know i feel that this is the right way and not the you know, I don't have to argue that anymore. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm always orientating myself, you know, of this feeling when it makes an inner click. Okay, that's a good way, you know, and then I'm, I'm going, you know, when it feels right, I'm always following the, the good feeling. And when it feels wrong, then I keep going and I keep changing the model. And because the mud is so easy to change and to reshape, it goes in a very fast way. And you can create a lot of solutions and it leads you then ultimately the, to the, that solution that really feels right. Great. Uh, and then the last question, why do you think mud has not made its way into the urban space? Would it be sustainable to use mud at that scale? Yeah, definitely. I just, you know, for example, Paris, they dig a new metro line. They have a lot of resources of earth. And my colleague tested the earth and said it's very good for building. A big part of it is very good for the suitable and um, people don't know what to do with these masses of earth you know of course there's also earth underneath our cities and the, the higher the land prices rate, um, rise the more people have to dig down for parking lots underneath the ground and you know more infrastructure goes underneath so there's a lot of resources that we could use for building. Great uh, I believe Manuel wanted to say a few words um, yeah, yeah, actually, I think uh, when the question was about the, um, how organic or playful could be the decisions, I think, however, there is in your, in your work something which is much more precise, which is where you were saying to collect information on the context, try to reuse things, try to keep things that they are not going a footprint. So I think that is well, quite well balanced when how to say, like, you are deciding, those are my tools, but then the rest, I think is also quite respectful to the environment and quite respectful to the, um, the clients or the locals, that the project is not defined on, like, it's not defined by you, this is going, how it's going to look, but they are participating and they are doing the project with you. So one point that I think that playfulness comes, as you said, with the brainstorming and with them actually deciding what to do. And I believe that because I have experienced similar things in, in Andabad, in the polls, and I feel that when you are proposing something which is going to have a public use, you really, I mean, it's, it's going to increase the, um, the, the rate of success if actually they built it, if they are in the process more than if you are coming with a specific design saying like that's going to look is finished now use it but if they are um, they're present from the beginning i think that's the way actually the project is uh, assuring the succeed i just wanted to ask you like uh, when when you have done all this participatory process and when you are involving people from different ages or different cultural backgrounds so what is the um, challenges that you are facing or how actually you are coming, because it's a negotiation between all of them. So how is more like a, you are a curator of decisions and you guide them how to design. So I would like to know a bit more in like the part of discussing with them in, in the decisions. Yeah, actually I try not to discuss too much because that's the, <laughs> that's the problem that we have in Europe. Um, there's a lot of energy wasted in discussing and I think the participation in the process is much more powerful. But I think there's a, a, a problem in the perception that the brain and the decision making is so much more important than the handwork. So we always think, you know, I mean, a child cannot design a school, doesn't have the training and also maybe doesn't want, you know, <laughs> the child wants to have a beautiful looking school. So it's our responsibility as planners to look, to observe the children, 
to really closely um, listen to their needs and then to find solutions that really meet the needs and, and, and also dreams. But it's our capacity as designers. It's not a five-year-old child who can design her or his own kindergarten. It's not possible. So, but we always have this thinking, you know, that this, this design work is so much superior and this decision-taking work is so much superior than, than being on a site and building. But actually, for this, for the children, it was much more, much more um, satisfying to be have their hands in the dirt and and seeing the result of the physical work. That was much more important than raising the hand and voting for this or for that. Mm -hmm. And I think, in particular in, in 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 the Western part of the world, we we think participation always, you know, as this kind of brain-based decision design kind of thing. And I think we should move more into the active one because there's a, also a lot of non-verbal communication on the site that also helps to, you know, to, to create a community much more better than just fighting for this idea or the other idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, mm -hmm. I really, really believe that. I just one last thing is that uh, when you said that you see the environment and you are not satisfied with it, I mean, the way it is. And I think that uh, your work is actually a quite um, like a critique to that, that you can see. So because we face the problem that we see that it's not sustainable, but actually we don't know how to solve it. Or we get into the, the, the trend that that's the way it is done. But I think that, that the way you are looking at things is in that sense radical yet respectful and i really really congratulate you for your work thank you thank you so much thank you thank you Manuel. yeah no th uh thank you so much i think um especially with covid and the remote world um it's so great you know when we have um folks like you who can come and speak to the students because it just brings a whole you know new level of inspiration and hopefully helps remind them you know why they've entered this field to begin with um because i think sometimes especially when it's all online you know they start to forget that so it was incredibly inspirational and such great work um and thank you again thank you thank you all all right so i think we'll end it here then um and then uh, take care everybody thank you thank you yeah, Manuel. thank you